Or you can, okay, recorded. There we go. So that little blip. Um, thank you for this welcome. And I would love to just give a little more introduction and context to the, what I'm thinking of sharing, then do some practice, then share some more, and then stop the recording and open it up. Does that sound good? Okay. Clear enough? Awesome. Um, so I'm showing up, uh, zooming in from Takaranto, from traditional homelands of many people, Anishinaabe, Wendat, Haudenosaunee, Chippewa, Mississauga, um, peoples, and I am showing up here as someone of white European ancestry. So I'm like by no means an expert on decoloniality, um, but I also see that this is deeply my and all of our work to engage in. Um, I'm much more rooted in the Dharma side of things, um, but having been a student of Thich Nhat Hanh, who has always been deeply radically engaged in the outer manifestation of liberation, as well as the inner manifestation of liberation. That's also where I'm showing up from. Um, and I'm wanting to, if anything, um, point to some really beautiful work that I hope you all check out for yourselves that um, from a collective called Gesturing Towards Decolonial Futures. I don't know if anyone has heard of them. A lot of their folks are based in Vancouver, um, but all across the larger Turtle Island and down in Brazil. Um, so that's a little bit of the context. And part of why I was so drawn to their work in particular is, um, like so many decolonial um, scholars, activists, elders present, um, there's so many reasons why we're in such a messed up state, why there's so much chaos and crisis. Oh, thank you, Carl. Um, and there's a lot of ways of looking at things that can get our brains like really, really saturated, that can get our emotions saturated. Um, and yet the way that this collective, as well as others see the root of the issue is that it's based in our sense of separation. And that's the same perspective that the Dharma takes, um, although there's really different articulations and I think that the two working together can actually strengthen each other so that's that's what i'm wanting to share from. Um, in particular gesturing towards decolonial futures presents the term separability um, to really point out the, the fact that we have, there actually is no separation, none of us are entirely separate from the weather, from our ancestors, from the economic and climate situation. But the idea of being separate has grown about. Um, the Dharma would say due to ignorance, um, we can also point to uh, the original sin, the doctrine of discovery aspects of Christian doctrine, um, capitalism, colonialism, patriarchy, all sorts of things. Um, and so this idea of, I think for a lot of us raised within coloniality, whether we're in dominant or non-dominant positions, uh, if we're used to what we call this modernity way of, of seeing things, it's, it's like it takes work to try to get through the ideas of separation that we've been indoctrinated into. It seems kind of natural for a lot of us to think, well, okay, I'm separate, but like, I know there's other ways of thinking about things where it's not separate. Has anyone ever heard the teachings of like non-self or interdependence and felt a little bit confused? I know I did for a very long time. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I didn't even raise my hand. My computer just does that. Um, I was really moved by, I call it just say GTDF, um, gesturing towards the colonial futures term, separability to like point out, oh, this is a concept that we were given and it's not actually our natural state. Um, 
And so I want to give us a chance to do a bit of practice with the elements, which is a traditional Buddhist practice, um, goes back to the earliest suttas, the earliest discourses recorded as given by the Buddha, and then make a connection back into what this can mean for us in our approach to life today, approach to the Dharma, approach to decolonization from our various locations and identities. Again, does that sound okay? Does that make sense enough? Yeah. Okay. So we'll probably do about 20 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes of formal practice. You're so welcome to be in any position. There really is no hierarchy of positions, whether your body wants to be lying down, standing, sitting. It's a little hard to do this practice while moving, doing something like walking or qigong. Um, but please just start the, the deep listening aspect of this practice by tuning in to your nervous system, to the, the state of right here and now, to see what position would actually support you. It would feel pretty decent, if not good. And then you can also tune in, like, does eyes open or close serve you right now to find easefulness and wakefulness as much as possible? Does having your camera on or off support easefulness and wakefulness? So please uh, give yourself permission to really tune in. I'm going to start with uh, three sounds of the bell in case the sound of a bell is hard for you you're welcome to turn the volume down or um i'm also going to sound it somewhat gently so hopefully it's not harsh on anyone's ears and you can just tune into listening as a practice First, can I tune into shifting from listening to sensations as much as we can access that? What we would call earth element. For a lot of us, the first place you might notice this is in all the contact points of the body to the grounds. So you might just notice pressure. Maybe some temperature. Any hard spots like elbows where the firmness of the bones is a little more obvious than others, or maybe the touching of teeth, if your teeth, teeth are touched, and that's a quality of the earth element. Any places in the body that feel dense or steady ways we can find the element of earth within the body and if being in the body feels like too much you can also notice the earth element of that which is holding up the body the ground the chair is within a building i'm assuming everyone's in buildings that's held by the earth 
And so it's, it's not just a concept. It's a physical reality that we can tune into. And the mind's likely to wander. That's what minds do. And then with gentle kindness and some clarity, whenever you notice the moving around, you can invite attention back to where else do I notice this earth element? And in a very tangible way, these bodies are made of earth. We eat plants and maybe animals that grew from molecules transformed from dirt. It's, it's not a, an esoteric concept. It's actually very very tangible the way that these bodies are made of earth. And just as tuning into the, the firm spots of the body get us in touch with earth, we can also find the water element anywhere there's moisture. You might notice saliva or mucus or tears or a bit of sweat. I'm not looking for anything special. Just with open curiosity. Is it possible to connect a little bit with the water element here and now? Are there any spots where you can feel the heartbeat and blood moving through the body? Sometimes that's accessible, sometimes it isn't. That's also the water element. Sometimes we can feel some digestion or full bladder water element. And likewise, it might be humid. That's water element around, outside these bodies. And as much as possible, can we be playful in this exploration? You no, know, there's, there's no heavy lifting to do here. There's no way to get this wrong. We're just exploring. I like to imagine a kid with a magnifying glass in the grass, just looking at bugs, that kind of, just like, hey, what can I find here? Attitude. And so from the water element, we can also shift to the fire element, the quality of temperature. Also, a lot of folks see this as digestion and transformation. Anything that's changing could be called a fire element. The most direct way most of us connect is through temperature. Even if parts of the body feel cold, it's relative to parts that are feeling warmer. 
And the fact that we aren't frozen popsicles is because there is this giant sun. <laughs> that giant fire element that feeds the plants we eat, that feeds our bodies, that, that keeps us alive, literally. Not just as an idea, but as a very tangible reality. So noticing the different spots of the body and the different temperatures to tune into the fire element. And again, maybe noticing the temperature around in the air. Maybe you have a patch of sunlight or the clouds blocking the sun. Still a way to connect to the fire element. And if one or two or all the elements don't feel very accessible, that's also this practice. You know, we don't need to force anything or fake anything. That's where it's all curious experiment. Finally, the air element. For a lot of folks, noticing the flow of breath in and out of the body is a really direct way to be in touch with the air element. Whether we sense it at the nostrils or the throat, the chest, the movement in the belly related to breathing. Or maybe just a general sense of the whole body of this little expansion, release. You might want to sense it more from the inside or more from the outside, depending upon what resonates for you, what feels safe and okay. Sometimes getting in touch with the air element is also supported by recognizing we are all breathing the same air. And kind of tuning into this shared experience or this wider sense. But if that's too much, then coming into the more individual sense might be more supportive so you can explore again what brings ease and alertness wakefulness and receptivity For the last few minutes, I want to invite us to take this practice in any direction we want. If it's feeling like a lot and a lot that's new, you're welcome to rest back in any practice you're familiar with. Um, if it's feeling generative, you might kind of just 
Notice all four, like, oh yeah, noticing some heat here. Fire element. Hmm, noticing some moisture. Water element. So that bit by bit we start to shift how we understand ourselves from an I, me, individual into a flow of natural processes that are not separate from the larger flow of natural processes of the whole earth and cosmos. And as we close this formal meditation practice, awareness, training, play, exploration time. Again, just dropping in this idea, if it's new for us, or maybe sinking in a little deeper if it's not new. This whole thing that seems like a me, mine, I, it's a flow of natural processes that is not separate from the larger flow of natural processes. That we can tune into in things as simple as the hardness of an elbow and swallowing saliva in the mouth. I'm going to sound the bell again to close. If you've been still, you might want to bring a little movement into the body if that helps you to orient. If your eyes have been closed, you might want to open them and gently look around if that helps the shift. Or you might want to 
keep your eyes closed and keep meditating and just gently let these words uh, flow in. So again, whatever supports you is so welcome. Um, it was already said in the introduction, but I again want to honor many, many Buddhist lineages. I've had uh, the honor <laughs> to get to study within um, Thich Nhat Hanh, the Vietnamese Zen master, peace activist, poet, um, many uh, environmental activist is definitely my biggest, my biggest um, teacher. Um, I lived in the community for six years. I was ordained under him and um, have been connected for about 20 years to that lineage. And I've also been honored to get to study with a number of insight teachers, including um, True North Insight community. And I've studied with Kay and Coral um, and others. So those are my two main roots in terms of the Buddha. And I always wanna honor that lineage and no one needs to be Buddhist here, but I just like to be very clear about where I'm coming from and uh, what's supporting me and what I'm doing my best to, to transmit of all the, the goodness that I've received. Um, so this, this, this non-self interbeing is so central to the Dharma. Um, it may or may, most of the time it doesn't get talked about in sort of like secular mindfulness. And when it's this concept that's thrown out there that's confusing, um, that's not really well unpacked, yeah, it might not do a whole lot of good. Um, but if, <laughs> if we're wanting to look at the wholeness of a Dharma path, a path of transformation of liberation, inner and outer, then how we understand ourselves is fundamentally important because so much of our pain <laughs> is stuck in how we understand ourselves, but also so much of the way that we hurt each other and that we hurt the planet is rooted in ways of understanding ourselves and each other that have mostly been historically conditioned and built upon. We're not even aware that we're just running through these models that, um, that have been passed down. And so, that's where I like to bring in like, hey, let's look at the notion of self, even though it's complicated and not something you're really going to get tons out of in 20 minute little <laughs> Dharma talk. Um, it's the type of thing that is not meant to be understood the way you read a textbook, read it, input it, output it in a test, move on. It's the type of thing that we need to like access a little bit, let the idea drop into our consciousness, you let it rest for a while drop in the idea again, let it percolate, let it germinate, let it interact with all the other ways that we're living. Um, and so in the Theravada or the, what a lot of us would call the insight tradition, the Southern school of Buddhism, we'll hear a lot the term non-self or no self. Anatta is the word in Pali, in kind of the Buddhist language, A-N-A-T-T-A. Um, and it's the negation of the sense of a separate, lasting, fixed self, because at the time of the Buddha, there was a lot of debates and a lot of theories about a personality or a, a self, not a personality, a self that would continue from lifetime to lifetime. And the Buddha, um, rather than like giving an alternate theory, just said, Nope, that's not what it is. He did a lot of negating, which can be a little confusing and challenging <laughs> to grasp upon if we've been raised in modernity, under coloniality, under patriarchy, all these ways of approaching the world that defines, that tries to put words on things and things into boxes and people into boxes. Um, so we're working from a whole different way of, of approaching wisdom. And in the Mahayana or the Northern School of which the Plum Village or Thich Nhat Hanh lineage is part of, we often speak more of emptiness or interbeing. And there is actually a similar idea, just a different way of getting at it, that 
everything is connected like you know there's earth and water and fire and air in all of us we can't actually like take out the sunshine if there was no sun literally there'd be no life on earth um but also you can't take out like one little thing you can't take out one part of the whole or the whole is changed um so with uh emptiness often Thich Nhat Hanh would say you know a, a, a cup that you would call empty doesn't mean that there's no cup <laughs> it's not saying that there isn't existence but that it's not what we think it is we're not actually full of the substance of self that we think ourselves to be um And so there's an image given of Indra's net, Indra being this sky god, um, and that the whole cosmos is a net and at each knot lies each being represented in a jewel that reflects every single other jewel, other being. And that anytime you move one part of the net, it impacts everything else. Has anyone ever heard of Indra's net before? Yeah. Um, so it's a really ancient image. I think it's actually even older than Buddhism, um, but the Buddha did, did use it. And so it's kind of a, it's a direct connection into this inseparability that gesturing towards decolonial futures speaks about in their particular approach to decoloniality because if if we're still buying into the mindset of separation that has been perpetuated through empire through coloniality through capitalism we actually can't <laughs> change the system because that's the like the linchpin that's the that's the foundational piece that keeps the whole system going um, you, you can't have systems of domination, you cannot have environmental degradation if you don't understand yourself as separate from the whole. When we understand ourselves as separate from the whole, not just in concept, but in the way we live, it actually will fundamentally change how we interact, it is the premise both in the Dharma as well as in at least this particular form of decolonial thought, but most forms. Um, And it sounds like just an idea. It can sound like just an idea. Um, but it's also like the most radical, <laughs> the most radical thing um, that can be changed. So much of our pain and suffering comes from moments of not just experiencing whether it's oppression, whether it's violence or small moments of difficulty, not just the experience itself, but then the feeling of going through it alone, which is another expression of this separateness. And so in bringing in the ideas of non-self and inseparability, um, it also brings in the whole question of like, what are we doing here? <laughs> What's this whole meditation thing about? Why are we practicing all this stuff? And we're all welcome to have different ideas. We don't have to have one common answer. But I think that reflecting on what draws us to meditation practice, to mindfulness, maybe the Dharma, maybe not the Dharma, um, is a really good question to keep asking. Uh, usually there's some pain somewhere, some difficulty. Very few folks are like, everything is so amazing. Everything's working out so well. I'm going to take on something that's uncomfortable <laughs> and sometimes really hard. Um, although some of us do come for like, wow, that's just really interesting. I want to try it out. Um, but most people that I know at least have come to these practices because of heartache, because of grief, because of rage, because of physical pain, um, because of climate anxiety. Um, and, and there's a lot of wisdom there because <laughs> the Dharma speaks directly to how do we deal with suffering? How do we deal with our hardships? Um, and yet mindfulness 
uh, especially as it has been co-opted and colonized um, by science, by Western society, um, often becomes this separate thing to just like make your individual self feel better. And not only is that problematic because it's not respecting <laughs> the roots of where the whole tradition comes from, um, but it also just like it's kind of dangerous because these practices often in the long run do lead to you know greater compassion and equanimity and we could even say self-regulation if we're going to use that more psychological tool term um, but in the process the practices are actually set up here to meet things as they are and sometimes that's meeting our pain and sometimes that's uncovering old traumas and sometimes that's becoming more aware that like we are stuck in a system that is burning us alive. And so it can be painful at times in this process and that's why this question of like why are we here, what are we doing is a good one to keep asking. And if sometimes you are finding difficulty <laughs> through the practice. Um, I both hope from the bottom of my heart <laughs> that it's not too overwhelming. Um, but I also, I also want to bring in some celebration for when our practice takes us into the difficulty and gives us more capacity to move through it. Um, both because that, that is aligned with the, the spirit of where this practice has come from. And this is another place of mutuality with a decolonial approach. Um, there's a, a podcast with a conversation between Vanessa Andriotti, who's a member of Just Friend to Us, Decolonial Futures, and um, well, it's, it's a podcast interview that I'm going to put in the chat. And in it, she's actually quoting some of the elders um, from the, oh, yeah, um, from the Wak Huni Hunikui people of the Amazon. I'm sorry, I didn't practice that already. I will put the link into the chat. And in it, she talks about how um, so many folks. She's talking about coming Western, um, modernized, mostly European rooted folks coming down to Indigenous lands to take medicine, uh, plant medicines. And she speaks about how so often people come looking for bliss, looking to get away from their problems, and um, looking for like a unitive, peaceful experience. Whereas, let me just copy this, and hopefully it can also get put into the show notes because it's a really fantastic podcast that gives you a much better idea <laughs> of all this work. Um, but she speaks that so traditionally these ceremonies, these plant medicines were offered for training in eldership. Training in how to find the message of how you're to serve your, your community. Training in how to be with difficulty. How to be with pain. And I just felt like, oh my gosh, that's also what the Dharma is about. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the Buddha would always teach about ethics before giving meditation instructions, yet so many of us coming from um, a modern society, coming um, new to the Dharma, especially from Anglo cultures, we want to like try the meditation first. We've been sold this idea that it's about feeling good, um, but actually like, it may or may not feel good. And what these practices are really skilled at is teaching us how to how to get through the hardship that is inevitable. And this this idea of like how to become a good elder is so important, even if it's not the language of the Dharma, um, but how, how to take responsibility. <laughs> Um, how to listen into like what what am I being called to do to serve my community to serve the world. These practices can really support these questions, which I would say is a decolonial approach without appropriating particular indigenous practices. Um, the, this framework of how we look at our spiritual engagement is where I think that 
there was something like very universally accessible and important wisdom to to reflect upon. Um, and the other piece of what I, I found really beautiful in a synergy between Dharma and decolonial futures' work is that um, it's a whole pedagogical collective. Um, the a lot of them are well university folks, but who have focused on K to twelve education. So they've come up with a lot of ways to explain really profound concepts um, of how the world got to be in the state it is in ways that can be understood by school kids, in university classrooms, in community settings, within Indigenous communities, doing organizing. Um, and so in their work, they keep saying, we are not giving you any solutions. <laughs> we are inviting folks to have questions and to stay with questions and to not jump to answers, to open to mystery to listen to how the earth is calling us not even to heal the earth because the earth <laughs> is what keeps us alive but how to tune in to the larger messages of what this time might be calling for to try something different even though we don't actually know it's gonna come out of it because it's actually the system of modernity that teaches fixed answers finite definitions that gives this illusion of guarantees of being able to the idea of like oh you know scientific progress is just going to make us impervious to the fluctuations of nature it was the promise that's been given for a few hundred years and it's obviously crashing and crumbling and so the important uh the importance of saying you know we don't know what's going to happen next is hugely important from a decolonial perspective, from an ecological perspective. In fact, um, I, I'll, I'll send a link to for um, uh, Vanessa Andriotti, who I mentioned, wrote a book called Hospicing Modernity. Um, and in it, her, her basic message is like, there is no way to fix what's going on. Our systems are dying. And like a human that's dying, you can keep saying, no, 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 we're going to save you. But there comes a point where it's actually cruel to do that. And that how can we relieve pain? How can we learn from the process? How can be a, we be as good to each other as possible as the shit is hitting the fan? As things are dying and crumbling. Is in many ways a much more compassionate and wise response so that whatever comes next can actually learn from the process as opposed to just being stuck in like a green technology like no, no no we'll just find better batteries and we'll find different solutions which has its place but it's not the fundamental place so i'm getting into sort of some very complex things so please listen to the podcast i'll also put in the link for the book um uh here it is and the thing is is actually again like Thich Nhat Hanh years and years ago was saying, humanity might last another 100, 300 years, and it might not. And so much of our eco-anxiety is about what's gonna to happen to the planet, but actually the, like, the grief, the heartache, the terror is what's gonna to happen to us humans. And the Dharma is not <laughs> gonna give us peaceful, pleasant answers. The Dharma is an invitation to meet reality as it is, which might include the survival of the human race, and it might not. And for some of you, I know this might feel like terrifying and upsetting to conceive of, but for some people, it's also relieving to go, oh, we're not lying about these things. Just like Sometimes, you know, we need to tune into the oppressions that, <laughs> that, that we are living through and understand the pain that is happening collectively, whether it's due to our gender, sexual orientation. And other times, like, we need to watch queer rom-coms and just, like, have happy <laughs> endings. I know it's, like, definitely part of my medicine some days. <laughs> um, hey, there's, like, there's always a both and. 
and so in the dharma especially for more of a as northern school um, being rooted in the zen tradition there's a huge importance given to not knowing uh, one of the early ancestral teachers would have this phrase of not knowing is the most intimate because when we think we know what's happening when we think we know how this works who i am who you are how systems work then we aren't actually in curious we aren't meeting the moment we aren't present we're actually just running out of old patterns in the mind that are that are saying oh this is this that's that and we kind of tune out from reality um so an approach that doesn't have solutions is deeply uncomfortable and yet it's actually much more alive and one of the profound ways that uh, this attitude of not knowing also called beginner's mind can get cultivated is through a practice that in Buddhism we also often call deep listening. Listening to our hearts, listening to the earth, listening to the ancestors, um, which is actually really similar to what gesturing towards decolonial futures work is calling towards. And so it gets another place of like, oh, we can really learn from each other, or we can we can we can learn from this synergy. Um, Oh, wow, the time is going faster than I thought. Um, two things to close. Um, one is to just take a moment um, to tune into listening to your own heart. Um, how, how is it right now? But. But not just how is it right now in a in a bigger sense there's so many ways that society teaches us like figure out what you want and go for it and it reinforces this individualistic sense of self and i find it's really helpful to shift to how am i called to serve how am i called to heal what is the earth what do my ancestors want of me we may find an answer, we may not, we may have images, we may have little things emerge and go, oh, maybe that's not real. What if we don't dismiss our intuitive body wisdom, our earth wisdom? Because that's actually part of colonial violence. So for just a minute, can we tune into a larger interbeing kind of wisdom and just see if anything emerges. I know I said two things, but I think that that's much more than enough. So in closing, um, if we can stop the recording, um, I wanna invite if anyone is willing,